Matthew chapter 1. <clears throat> I have a friend who grew up in a very well-to-do but dysfunctional home. Her dad built speedboats. Uh, he raced them. He also sold them. He would build them and sell them to the drug dealers and make them fast enough they could get away from the cops. And then he would build speedboats for law enforcement so that they could catch the drug dealers. And then he'd turn around and build faster ones for the drug dealers. Very profitable business. It was a cycle and he made a good living at it. Her mother was a debutante. She liked the nicer things in life. She liked the, um, the clubs. My friend, who was not petite, had two sisters who were. Her mother enjoyed dressing her sisters up in frilly little dresses and showing them off to her friends while my friend was left out. The day she graduated from high school, her mother said she wanted her out of the house. And so she sent her packing with nothing but her car and her suitcase. For a good while, my friend lived in her car. She'd park in her parents' driveway at night where she felt safer. If her mother woke up and called her before she left in the morning, her mother would scream at her. Um, she would live with one guy or another looking for a place to stay, looking for acceptance and love. Ended up having a number of abortions, enough to where she doesn't even know how many she had. The day she graduated from high school, her mother said she wanted her gone. My friend ended up joining the army. And while she was in boot camp, they were training men and women together, one of those uh, trial programs. A number of guys in her unit didn't like her very much because she could clean, field strip, and reassemble a rifle quicker than any of them could. One day while on a run, she had her one and only asthma attack, the only one that she's had in her life. It was enough to get her kicked out of the military. She ended up becoming a paramedic. While working as a paramedic, she injured her back. Working with a petite woman who could not carry her end of the stretcher. And so she was put on disability and let go. Along the way, looking for love and acceptance, she was in and out of one relationship after another. Anywhere along that journey, my friend could have reached the point where she thought, God could never love me. Look at all that I've done. Or she could have said, I could never accept Christ. Look at all of the bad and hurt and pain he's allowed in my life. How in the world could I trust him? But she didn't. She became a Christ follower and eventually found the love she had looked for all along. My friends, it doesn't matter what your background is like. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. God loves you. Wants you to be part of the family. And will not accept any excuses. It does not matter how much difficulty and pain you have gone through after the terrible price Jesus has paid for your salvation. When it comes to judgment day, God will not accept excuses. Each one of the Gospels were written by a different writer for a different audience. Matthew wrote his Gospel with the Jews in mind. So he began his account with the lineage of Jesus, showing that he was rightfully the Messiah. And in the genealogy of Jesus, I believe we can find this morning three reasons why God will not accept any excuses. Look there with me, if you will, please. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. 
Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Aram, Aram fathered Amenadab, Amenadab fathered Nasham, Nasham fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab, Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. Then David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife, Solomon fathered Rehoboam, Rehoboam fathered Abijah, Abijah fathered Asa, Asa fathered Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat fathered Joram, Joram fathered Uzziah, Uzziah fathered Jotham, Jotham fathered Ahaz, Ahaz fathered Hezekiah, Hezekiah fathered Manasseh, Manasseh fathered Ammon, Ammon fathered Josiah, and Josiah fathered Jehoachan and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Then after the exile to Babylon, Je Jehoachan fathered Salathiel, Salathiel fathered Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel fathered Abed, Abed fathered Eliakim, Eliakim fathered Azor, Azor fathered Zadok, Zadok fathered Achim, Achim fathered Eliad, Eliad fathered Eliezer, Eliezer fathered, fathered Mathen, Mathen fathered, fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who was called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David until the exile of Babylon, 14 generations, and from the exile of Babylon until the Messiah, 14 generations. Very inspirational reading the genealogy, isn't it? <laughs> but the Lord has promised that all scripture is for our good. And I believe in this passage of scripture we can see together three reasons why God won't accept our excuses. First, I want you to understand God will not accept your excuses because your situation does not seal your fate. Your situation does not seal your fate. Notice, if you will, a few of the people God had Matthew include in Jesus' genealogy. Verse 6 mentions King David. David was called a man after God's own heart in spite of his sins. David loved the Lord. The same verse mentions Solomon, who asked the Lord for wisdom. He built a temple and for the majority of his life served and followed God. Verse 7 mentions Rehoboam. Rehoboam despised God's people. He thought only about his own comfort and led his people to worship idols. Verse 7 also mentions Abijah. The Bible tells us that Abijah, Rehoboam's son, walked in the sins of his father. Verse 7 mentions Asa. 2 Chronicles chapter 14 verse 11 tells us that Asa cried to Jehovah his God. Verse 8 mentions Jehoshaphat. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 tells us Jehoshaphat prayed. He said to God, our eyes are on you. Verse 8, we see Joram listed. The Bible tells us, but he walked in the way of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done. Verse 8 mentions Uzziah, which tells us when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. Verse 9 mentions Jotham. Jotham was victorious over many, victor uh, many opposing armies. 2 Chronicles 27, 6 tells us, So Jotham became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord his God. Verse 9 mentions Ahaz, Jotham's son. The Bible tells us, he became king when he was 16. He did not do right in the eyes of the Lord. He made molten images to the Baals. Verse 9 mentions Hezekiah. The son of Ahaz prayed, O Jehovah our God, save thou us. We could continue on and on and we find the same, rep the same repetition. A godly king can have a godly son. Or a godly king can have an ungodly child. An ungodly parent can have an ungodly child or an ungodly parent can have a godly child. You see, my friend, a, a child may follow in the footsteps of their parents, but they don't have to. You see, my friends, your situation doesn't seal your fate. There are many people today who claim that they act the way they do because of their environment. 
They act the way they do because their parents acted that way. They say, it's not my fault. I was brought up that way. If you knew what my home life was like, then you would understand. We live in a society and in a time where people try to make excuses for the way that they act and the decisions they make. They want to say it's their parents' fault. They didn't love me enough or they pressured me or too much or I was potty trained too early or my parents did something wrong. If you only knew the bad breaks I've had. If you only knew the way people have treated me and cheated me. If you've been through what I've been through, then you would act the same way. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 says, The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment of the son's iniquity. My friend, your situation, your background, and your environment does not give you an excuse for rejecting Jesus Christ. And it does not give you an excuse for living in sin. You cannot blame your laziness in following Jesus on others. You cannot blame the sin in your life on your environment. You cannot blame your bitterness on your spouse. You cannot blame your anger on your boss. You cannot say the devil made me do it. For the Bible says that it is your own choice. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6. We read, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. James chapter 4 verse 8 tells us come near to God and he will come near to you. Jeremiah 29 13 says you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. In other words you are who you want to be today. You are where you are in your relationship with God and your walk with God because of the decisions and choices you have made and the decisions and choices you continue to make. The Lord said you will search me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. God will not accept any excuses from you. Because your situation does not seal your fate. Second, I want you to understand that God will not accept your excuses. Because your past does not determine your future. Your past does not determine your future. In this genealogy, there are four women mentioned. Now it's unusual enough to find women listed in a Jewish genealogy. They normally only mention the fathers. But there are four women mentioned in this genealogy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we were to find four women listed as ancestors of Jesus, we would expect to find godly women mentioned. Mentioned like women like Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah. These four women stand out because they are missing. Instead, the Lord had Matthew list four other women. He lists Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Uriah's wife. Or as King James puts it, her who had been the wife of Uriah. Now what is it that makes these four women stand out? Look there, verse 3. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. If you remember, Tamar is Judah's daughter-in-law. Her first two husbands died and she was childless. So she disguised herself as a prostitute, tricked and slept with her father-in-law Judah, and gave birth to his son. She was guilty of adultery and guilty of incest, and yet we find her in the lineage of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 5, list Rahab. If you remember Rahab, was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. She hid the Israelite spies so that their lives were spared, so that her life 
and her family's lives were spared when the city was destroyed. Verse 5 also mentions Ruth. The Bible records nothing truly sinful about Ruth other than the fact that she was a Moabitess. And the Lord specifically forbade His people from marrying Moabites. She came from a people, a nation, built up of people who did not believe in one true God, but who worshipped idols instead. And out of that nation came Ruth, a Moabitess. In verse 6, And Jesse fathered King David, then David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. King James says, she who had been the wife of Uriah. That is Bathsheba. Her sin was so terrible that Matthew blushed at the thought of even mentioning her name. Bathsheba is the woman who by choice or otherwise cheated on her husband with King David. She became pregnant by him, so David had her husband killed. And then she married the man who murdered her husband. Each of these women were either sexually immoral, or they came from a nation of unbelieving people, and yet God chose to use them in the lineage, in the genealogy of His Son, in spite of their past and their backgrounds. Save your places. Turn with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Do you not know that the unjust will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people. Idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. Oh, I thank the Lord that he didn't stop there. But continues in verse 11, Some of you were like this, but you were washed. You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. My friend, I don't care what you have in your past. I don't care what mistakes you have made or what sins you have committed. I don't care how long you have run from God or how many people you've hurt. In spite of it all, God loves you and will forgive you if you ask. In spite of our past, in spite of our sins, God loves us. He will not accept our excuses because your past doesn't determine your future. Third, God will not accept your excuses because God does not change his mind. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 1. This historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I believe Matthew referred to Jesus as the son of David and the son of Abraham for a very special reason. If you remember, God once promised Abraham that through him all nations would be blessed. Well, the Jews certainly were not blessing the world at that time. For the most part, they separated themselves from Gentiles. They looked down their noses at them and had very little to do with them. It wasn't until Jesus came offering salvation to all, seeking to save the lost, that all nations were blessed through the lineage of Abraham. Likewise, God told David that one of his descendants would sit on the throne forever. It was only a few generations after David's death that his descendants quit ruling. 
It wasn't until Jesus came, born through the lineage of David and again ascended to heaven, that one of David's lineage again assumed the throne to rule forever. Many people had given up on the promises of God in the Lord, in the, in the Lord and in the New Testament. Some had given up believing that God had changed his mind and that his promises would never be fulfilled. But my friends, I want you to know that your God does not change his mind. The promises he made in the days of old still apply today. In Lamentations chapter 3 beginning in verse 22 we read the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. For I the Lord do not change. And my friends, God promised to help with temptations. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 he says, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted beyond that which you are able, but will with the temptation also provide a means to escape that you may be able to bear it. God is a God of His Word. He keeps His promises. Several years ago, the Orlando Sentinel reported on a man by the name of Timothy Pilgrim. Timothy was charged on two charges of murder, four charges of attempted murder, after driving over six outlaw biker gang members on their motorcycles. Later he blamed his rage on a history of drugs, alcohol, and childhood abuse. He said he was abandoned at age four, had been in and out of juvenile detention by 14, spent nearly a year in prison for stealing a car when he was 18. He said, it's not my fault. It's my family and my environment. Listen, my friend. The courts did not accept his excuses. And God will not accept ours. The friend I mentioned earlier could have given up. She could have made excuses saying my environment was too tough growing up. My mother never loved me. I can never change. She could have said I've made too many mistakes. God will never forgive me. Instead she chose to believe the word of our unchanging God. The God who still delivers today. The God who still gives victory today. The God who still forgives today. The God who can change your life forever. Let me ask you. Will you today quit making excuses? Will you today take God at his word? Will you say, Lord, I want deliverance. I want to make a difference.